dialogue team so far, I think, have made every piece. One of them is Dr. Richard, is the other being myself, as I represented Dr. Bunty and different candidates CPCR. Over that period, uh, Dr. Richards and I, even though we are a slightly different build and shape, uh, have got to know and uh, treasure each other quite a bit. We've worked together, we're both very much committed to this dialogue. Now, we tend to make goofy jokes on account of some of the textbooks we have, you know. When we do the beliefs of different churches, we have a book about the religious bodies of North America. Well, as I've alluded to, Dr. Richards is one of the larger religious bodies in North America. Born at an early age, his dad was a clergyman and the presiding bishop of the Reformed Episcopal Church. Now, the Reformed Episcopal Church dropped out of the Anglican Communion, as it were, in the 19th century. They did their own thing, lived on their own planet. They've come a bit more in, into the Anglican mainland, as it were, and now they are, there are four dioceses and parts of the Anglican Church of North America. During his student days, Jonathan spent quite a bit of time worshipping with the Missouri Synod. You said how many years? Oh, three or four. Some yeah. Was also well, there are miracles on earth. He got to know us quite well, and actually, he likes us. Now, he's got his doctorate also from the Lutheran Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. Very discovered a different kind of Lutheranism, got something out of it. But he may feel just a little bit more upon the bus. Right now, Jonathan is, the, is an associate professor, he's the dean, he's the only full time officer of the Reformed Fiscal Seminary in Woodwell, Pennsylvania. The president, Bishop David Hicks, is also the diocesan bishop. Bishop David is the bishop of uh, Paul Luth, Reverend Paul Luth. They have Reverend Victors, you see. Victor, he's a cure. He's one of our students. Anyway, um, Jonathan, I've quite forgotten what your what topic is, and I don't have the brochure in front of me. But I know it's going to be wonderful. Welcome, and we look forward to listening. I was thinking that if I was born in Britain, was Canadian, Lutheran, half my size, and had a lot more hair, I'd be Dr. Stevenson. <laughs> but I am not, and thankfully we do have one Dr. Stevenson. Uh, dear friends, brothers and sisters, in our only one Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, with due respect to my fathers and God, my bishops, and my dear friend, Dr. Stevenson. I am very honored to be here with you today. As I said, this is the beginning of the fifth year of the dialogues between the Anglican Church in North America, the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod, and the Lutheran Church Canada. I want to thank Dr. Winger, Dr. Stevenson, and all of you at Concordia Lutheran Theological Seminary here in St. Catharines for welcoming us to the symposium today and for hosting these dialogues. And while Dr. Stevenson uh, began as an observer uh, in these dialogues, and I didn't know that he was going to say the things he said, and he has no idea that I'm going to say the things uh, I'm about to say. <laughs> but while, while he began as an observer, uh, and uh, the mention was made that the Lutheran Church Canada was a minor part of, of these dialogues. I, I would have to say that Dr. Stevenson has been a major cog and is a major cog in these dialogues, and that the Lutheran Church Canada uh, is a, a full partner and an important partner in these dialogues, and we have all grown uh, and learned together and uh, grown again as brothers uh, in Christ. Now on to the lecture. Uh, culture of want, culture of ruin. And I must say, before I get fully into the lecture, no one told me that this wasn't academic. <laughs> Not that that would have mattered if they had. 
Uh, my, my dear wife, Beth, for a couple decades has kindly proofread all my sermons, articles, papers. And she would almost always read the paper and say, that was very good, honey. I found a couple typos, but it was very good. And as, as my education went on in the past few years, she would say, that was very good, honey. Uh, I found a couple typos. Uh, but I don't know how much of a help I really am to you because I don't understand anything you said. <laughs> that, that, that has to do with the academic side. But thankfully, this time she proofread my, my lecture and she said, that was very good, honey. Only a couple typos. And, and I understood it. So, so hopefully, uh, you will too. Now, one might posit that the rise of militant secularism is because of a decrease in faithful Christian practice that interacts with society and engages popular culture. Certainly, rabid legalistic practice has been blamed for the onslaught of disbelief prevalent in our age. Submissive Christianity has undoubtedly done nothing to stem the tide of increased secularization in North America and the rest of Western culture. We certainly have to take a long, hard look at our faith and practice and how we engage a worldly materialistic ethos. Yet we must recognize that the rise of secularism is related to a variety of factors. Further, Christianity and faith practice has often been a minority position and even can flourish in it. When dealing with a significant Lutheran audience, I imagine it is safe for me to say, and it's already been said, so I know it's safe to say, that an answer to an important question has something to do with law and gospel. Namely, secularism is epidemic in society because of sin, our failure and inability to live under and up to the law. The solution is nothing else than to fully embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ and shine it as brightly as we can in a world that is lost and dying and is in need of the life-saving intimacy that is only available in Christ. Yet it is important to understand where Christianity in North America is and the reasons that it got there. The decline of Christianity in the West and the rise of secularization have been attributed to a variety of factors for well over a century. Many celebrated thinkers and scholars have spent considerable time studying and writing about the subject, including Max Weber, Karl Marx, Charles Darwin, Sigmund Freud, and Friedrich, Friedrich Nietzsche. Not long ago, a significant majority of people in Western civilization believed in a God who created the world, had a plan for it, and redeemed it. Now most would question one or more of those ideas. Quite a few would adamantly attack or scoff at anyone who advanced such thoughts. Most of us have probably experienced that from time to time. Now I knew from an early age that there were elements of culture that were contrary and even opposed to my faith. After all, I was born in New York City in the 1960s. I remember some things that my mother tried very hard for me not to see, including as we passed youths in front of the United Nations, uh, body painting. Uh, in a very inappropriate way. <laughs> My faith came head to head, really, with secularism, most of when I first went to college. In my sophomore year, one of my biology professors confronted me in the hallway and asked to speak with me. Now, I went to a very large university, Pennsylvania State University. So when a professor asks to speak with you individually, uh, that's a big thing. And that professor immediately told me 
that if I wanted to become a good biologist, that I had to give up my faith. He proceeded to tell me about historical criticism, JEDP theory, and various reasons that I needed to not only question, but also jettison my faith. He explained that he had been a good Southern Baptist and rejected that faith and ideas, and everything linked with him so that he could be a good scientist. And I could be one too, if only I let go of my faith. He implored me to do it. Many students over the last several decades have had similar experiences in the process of higher education. Now, I am not here to bash higher education. I think higher education is important, and those of us involved in it have a very big responsibility. But the fact is that predictably, statistics show that a great majority of those entering college in the United States with an active Christian faith report rejecting it by the time they graduate. And I imagine that the numbers are very similar here in Canada. Certainly education, the enlightenment, and rationalism have been linked with the rise of secularization and the decline of Christianity, as have a myriad of other movements, ideas, events, and advancements, including science, romanticism, urbanization, population decline, commercialization, technology, equal rights, increasing church scandals, and violence. At some level, linking all of these factors is human desire and want. In North America, we have very much embraced what I like to call a Burger King culture. People want to have it their way and have it now. Human desire and progress are at the center of our society. While in our lifetimes, we have seen an environment that is increasingly not just non-Christian, but anti-Christian. We must realize that this is nothing new for the life of faith. And that the solution is not to repudiate society, or even human wants and longings, but by the grace and work of God to help enlighten and transform them. Throughout the Old Testament, the people of God are challenged by the cultures of their day, they are called back repeatedly to following the ways of God and not letting cultural temptations or acceptable norms steer their course or demand their allegiance. Lest we think that the solution is an isolated theonomic state, we are confronted by the people of the New Testament, including Jesus Christ himself, who are dealing with an oppressive culture that if not counter to their faith, certainly does not embrace it or share its trajectory. While some of Christ's day wanted to fight culture at the time, like the Romans, or avoid those with different ideas, like the Samaritans, Christ and the early church show us a different way, one of loving engagement, a steadfast holding to the faith in the in the face of all difficulties and threats, coupled with a persistent desire to care and reach out to others, even when they are different, strange, alien, or in opposition. This is an extremely big responsibility and an increasingly difficult one. Having to face secular humanists that see religion, and often Christians in particular, as the core of what is wrong with our society is challenging enough. <clears throat> Increasingly, there is very vocal opposition from the populace and even our governments that calls for Christianity to be removed from the public square. There are Muslims who want to see Christians converted or exterminated. There are those within the Christian church who call for tolerance that will see the values, beauty, and even truth in different value systems, cultures, behaviors, and even religions. 
Christianity, as we express it, we are told, imposes its values on others, is intolerant, and needs to change. Everything can be tolerated except confession, biblical Christianity. While God does not change, Christians can and do change. In Christ, all are a new creation. Transformation and sanctification are the changes that are needed, not only for us, but also for the world. The whole creation groans, waiting for redemption. Certainly that is not the change the secularists are looking for. But that is the only ultimate cure for our ills, those of society and militant secularism. That is the hope which we live for. In dealing with these issues, it is important to understand some philosophical underpinnings. In the time of the New Testament, much of the intellectual life and value system had come from the Greeks. Ideas, thought, and reason were the root of virtue and goodness, while the material and the physical were seen as evil. The Greeks thought that the spirit and knowledge were trapped in a body, that the body was a prison of flesh. When Paul preached about the resurrection of the dead, it repulsed them, and it didn't make any sense. Why would you want a body back? Why would God himself want to take human form, be incarnated with a body? Of course, these ideas, seeing the spiritual as positive, the body and the physical as negative, were also embraced by Gnosticism, a heresy and cultural phenomenon with which the early church had to contend. The problems we are dealing with in North America today are different, yet they are still rooted in the issues surrounding the value of spirit and body. But I would say there has been a reversal in our culture today, the body and material are celebrated. You don't have to look very hard to see that that is definitely the case. Certainly, ideas and reason are touted as well, but certainly not an ultimate truth. Our culture does not have an aversion to the flesh and the physical like the Greeks did. Part of the issue that we must confront as the church is this reversal. Most of Western Christian, Western Christian theology and thought is rooted in Greek philosophy and thought. In the church today, there is an emphasis on thoughts and ideas. Theology is indeed important in both word and deed. Both the incarnation and resurrection are essential to our faith. God became flesh for us. Yet, we romanticize the Incarnation. We do not emphasize nearly enough that God became a man for us. He identifies with us, humbling himself to the point that he lived under the conditions of temptation, suffering, pain, emotion, and death. Christ identified with who we are and redeemed us. We are called to reflect and proclaim Christ in the world identifying with humanity and earthly concerns. Jesus did not only seem to be human, that is docetism. If we individually or corporately as the church withdraw from worldly concerns or cease to address them with a sensitivity and love to which God calls us, we are wrongly overemphasizing the spiritual and mental to the exclusion God has not and does not ignore our physical concerns or the physical concerns of this world. While we know that we do not live by bread alone, we are taught to pray for our daily bread. We pray for God's kingdom here on earth and in heaven. God instituted the sacraments, not as mere tokens and badges, but effectual symbols that work upon us spiritually and physically. Not coincidentally, 
Christ instituted the sacraments with earthly, physical things, on which our lives depend, water, bread, and wine. God continually pours himself out for us in our earthly and physical states, and wants us living for him in the world, without being of the world, no matter how dark and dreary it might get. In John 20, 19 through 23, Jesus commissions the disciples and the church saying, As the Father has sent the Son, so I send you. As Jesus was sent, so are we. We are sent out in the world to represent Christ and live in obedience to Him as an example to the community and society while caring for and interacting with it. Rob Whitaker has been a professor at Trinity Anglican School for Ministry in Ambridge, Pennsylvania, points out that in his excellent, excellent commentary on John, both of these matters, entering into the community and maintaining the community and its members, are a significant part of the missionary part of this commission. For the life of the community itself is a major aspect of witness to the world. It is through the disciples' unity with God and with one another that the world will be confronted with the truth about the Father and the Son. Harry R. Bohr wrote an excellent article analyzing this issue of the church and culture and the implication of the commission of Christ in John. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. His essay, On Becoming Flesh, The Church's Challenge, was published in the Reform Journal in 1972. Its insights are most apropos today. Bauer writes, the question posed by the as and the so of our Lord's command is, can the church, in imitation of her Lord, become the very flesh of those to whom she ministers, in and out of the church, while yet remaining fully and truly what she is, the body of Christ, the church of God. The perennial temptation of the church is to emphasize one pole of her being at the expense of the other. The apparent inability of the church to hold to the clarity of her being without polarizing is no small part of the division between evangelical and liberal. Can we resist the pressures to unmake ourselves, church, while yet entering fully and naturally into the life of the here and now, humanity of our community. Can we resist the temptations to become less than one with that community, while yet remaining the church that we are? Can we live and serve without pleading the true interests of the one against the true demands of the other? Can we develop the kind of vertical horizontals that find it impossible to serve God without serving man, or to serve man without serving God? Can we so witness among men that we reflect the full grace and truth of our Lord as he walked among us in the days of his flesh? In the book, The Lamb's Agenda, why Jesus is calling you to a life of righteousness and justice. Samuel Rodriguez describes a similar horizontalism and verticalism as the nexus of the cross, where we are both looking and stretching up to God, our sovereign Lord and Creator, while reaching out to our fellow humanity and the world with our arms outstretched like the cross. This is what Jesus calls us to. As we are reminded in the summary of the law, we are called to love God with all our heart, our entire mind, and all our soul, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. This isn't an either-or situation. We are called to serve and obey God, and also in the name of Christ, to serve and love humanity and the world. We cannot do one without the other. 
as portions of the church have emphasized either pole to the exclusion of the other. It has done its part in nurturing opposition and even the militant secularism we are dealing with today. When the law is preached without the gospel, people are turned away from legalism and hopelessness. When care is given and social ills are addressed physically, but the true message of the gospel is ignored, compromised, or distorted. Lasting hope is not given, and the deeper needs of society are not addressed. In How the West Really Lost God, Mary Elberstadt maintains that the reason for the decline of Christianity and the rampant rise of secularism is the double healings of faith and family. Rather than see the decline of the strong family unit as a result of the decline of religion, she explains that the decline in Christianity is in part a result of the decline in the family. It is through the family unit that faith is nurtured, values and morals are taught, and relationships are built. It is not surprising that the church has been successful when it has not only nurtured individual ties, but emphasized that the body of Christ is the extended family to which we are called. Recognizing that all people are created in the image of God and are called to be part of our family in Christ is essential to the church's mission and to combating the rise of secularism. The Alpha Course has been so successful because it builds on family ties and the corporate bonds that God calls us to as His assembly, bringing people together, having them share a meal and their ongoing concerns, while addressing both spiritual and bodily needs with the love of Christ. We must not lose hope with our society or the cultures around us. Our hope is in Christ. By continuing to serve Christ and in turn all humanity in the world with his love, we are doing that which the gospel calls us to. We, be we behave in obedience and we reach out in service. Our desires and the desires of other human beings are God-given, but they are only truly satisfied by a deep relationship with the living God. Filling the desires in other ways indeed leads to ruin, but filling them with the love of Christ leads to new life. Key to our calling and combating the secularism of, the, of this and every other age is faithful mission and discipleship. We must work together to transform ourselves and our societies into loving communities that live and reflect the love of and truth of God. And this must be done by strengthening the church for its mission. The bishops of the Global Fellowship of Confessing Anglicans emphasize this in their Nairobi communique, and I close with their eloquent words. We must keep stressing that our identity is primarily found in Christ, rather than in national, ethnic, or tribal attachments. In addition, there are many pressures on Christians today which require a degree of maturity in order to withstand them. These include aggressive secularism, where increasingly Christians are being told that their faith must find expression in private and not in public life and where the contribution of Christianity to the public good is denied. <clears throat> Militant Islam, which continues to threaten the existence and ministry of the church in some places, and seductive syncretism, which introduces supposedly alternative <coughs> approaches to God and thereby denies the uniqueness of Christ. Let us all continue to work together for the gospel of Jesus Christ, and his kingdom here on earth and in heaven, and stem the tide of militant secularism. Thank you.